against the Big Rig Bull, Texas Truck Accident, Lawyer Richard Alexander, here again on a Monday afternoon. In today's CLE, we're going to talk about pre-inspection reports, end-of-day reports, stop tractor trailers, and annual inspections of tractor trailers. So sit back, stay tuned, and just enjoy the show. So let me briefly talk about the Texas Trucking Show that I went to yesterday. First of all, it was awesome. Okay, I mean, they had so many classic trucks up there. It was just, they had Kenworth, Mack, Peterbilt, um, Freightliner. I mean, they just had all kinds of trucks up there, and it was amazing. Um, also, to get to see the different types of trailer beds and the materials that they're made out of was an excellent thing as well. Um, some of the telematics and the logistic companies were up there to kind of get a view of how truckers and companies are managing these loads that they're taking back and forth. If you're interested in being a truck driver, I mean, it is a respectable profession. Um, they had Houston Community College uh, was down there, and they were pretty much not necessarily signing people up, but they were letting you know that they do have a truck driver school that cost about $3,500 altogether. Uh, and I believe you can go through like a six-week program and there were so many trucking companies out there that were looking to hire people. Uh, it looks like you pretty much could get you almost a guaranteed job. I got an early Father's Day gift here. Not the knife, but this right here. Let's see what it is, you know. Can you see it? Maybe you can. Let's see. Well, we're going to be decorating the office with this. It is a Kenworth T700 tanker truck. So I think I'm going to put this in my office. Not the reception area, but uh, I'm gonna put this back in the back in the box until I move downstairs. Probably at the end of this week or so. Probably move all my stuff down in there uh, on Saturday or something like that. So that's that. Today's personal injury question of the day is: What is the most common cause? of car accidents and truck accidents in America? The answer is driver fatigue or drowsy driving. Did you know that 6,000 fatal crashes occur every year because of driver fatigue or drowsy driving? My advice to you is to try to get as much rest as possible before you get on the roads here in Texas. And that's the personal injury question of the day. So we're here again on Monday, um, and we're dealing with the part two of the FMCSR overview. Um, I don't know if you can see me. I don't know if you can see the screen, but I think you can. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, so we're talking about the FMCSR overview part two. What I'm focusing on this time is pre-trip inspections uh, and end-of-day reports. So. Every time a truck driver gets ready to operate a commercial motor vehicle, what they have to do is fill out a pre-trip inspection report uh, that details that they went over certain things uh, uh, dealing with the truck and its maintenance before they actually operate it. So I don't have the sheet here with me. I wish I did, but it's basically a sheet that they have to go down and it tells them, you know, uh, do you need hazmat placards? Is the gas tank full? Uh, do you have you checked the brake lights and everything else? But just for the purposes of this presentation, we're just going to go down the nine main things that they look for when they're doing a uh, pre-trip inspection. The first thing is service brakes. They're checking the brakes to make sure that they're operational. Um, if they're not operational and they, and they have to have someone work on those brakes, then the they have to go to a particular type of brake technician and the person that operates on those brakes 
has to have served at least a one-year apprenticeship to be able to do that. That's how serious commercial motor vehicle truck law is. I mean, that's just how serious this situation is because, like I said, I went to that uh, Texas trucking show yesterday and saw those magnificent pieces of machinery. But, like I said, at the same time, they can be very dangerous because it's, it's heavy machinery. So, they got to check the service brakes. The second thing they have to do is check the parking brakes. Okay, we know what parking brakes are. They have to check the parking brakes. And that, the third thing is they have to check the steering mechanism. I think I talked in a vlog earlier when I was talking about the road check uh, 2019, and I was speaking on how, uh, you know, how you can check the steering mechanism and whatnot. Uh, the, the fourth thing they have to check is the lighting devices and reflectors. The fifth thing are the tires. Obviously, you're going to check the tread and stuff like that. Six, they're going to check the horn and make sure it works. Seventh, the windshield wipers. Eight, rear vision mirrors. And the ninth thing is coupling devices. So coupling devices are, you know, what it makes the trailer and the tractor attach, stuff like that. Um, the other thing that they need to check, a truck driver always has to check on a pre-trip inspection report, is whether or not the emergency equipment is inside or is functional uh, on the 18-wheeler or the tractor trailer. You have to make sure that stuff actually works. Um, when you're dealing with a commercial motor vehicle and you're dealing with these pre-trip inspection reports, what you're really doing, just in a nutshell, is you're trying to make sure that the truck is in a safe operational condition. You're not going to have any breakdowns. There's not going to be an emergency because the equipment was a, uh, you had a, an equipment failure on the road or anything like that. So every time you get in, I mean, every time, not before you get in the cab, but every time you do the pre-trip inspection report, what you have to do is you have to also go back and check the driver's report, inspection report before you. So if someone else drove that truck the day before you and they made a report, you have to check off on that report and make sure that all of those issues that they had in that report are fixed and you have to sign off on it before you get in that truck or before you get in the cab of that truck. Now, this is the thing though. So on the end of day, we just talked about the pre-trip inspection report. Now on the end of the day report, an end of the day report doesn't necessarily always have to be filed if you are a commercial motor vehicle driver. So you're only going to file, or I'm sorry, you're only going to create and report an EOD or end of day report if there was an actual problem with the 18-wheeler or the commercial motor vehicle. So that can kind of raise a conundrum in the event that one of the drivers comes out here and causes a wreck because you don't really know if the truck was inspected or if the person just failed to put together an end of the day report. So it's very important for truck drivers, just to CYA, to fill out an inspection report if there was something wrong with that truck. Because if not, well, you're going to have people like me coming after you. Um, and you're not going to be able to defend yourself because of the fact that you didn't do what you're supposed to do. So, like I said before, uh, the driver does not have to complete a report at the end of the day if there are no defects in the vehicle. If there is an issue with the, uh, with the commercial motor vehicle parts inspected at the beginning of the day, then the issues must be noted at the end of the day on the EOD report. So if you had issues, you got to fill it out. If you didn't have issues, you have to fill it out. I mean, if you, didn't have, if you didn't have issues, you don't have to fill it out. If you had issues, you have to fill that portion out. Um, moving on to the annual inspection. So the annual inspection of a commercial motor vehicle is just pretty much, I'm not going to say it's pretty much like every other car on the road, but you have to have a 12-month uh, annual inspection. Every 12 months you have to have that uh, commercial motor vehicle inspected. And it can be inspected by a variety of parties as long as their standards meet the uh, minimum standards for inspection. So you can have it uh, inspected by a Federal Highway Association inspector. You could have it. Uh, you could have it um, inspected by DOT or state government uh, governing agency. A variety of people can inspect it, but like I said before, they have to meet those minimum FC, FMCSR standards. Um, 
moving on to, uh, we, we talked about cargo securement uh, in one of the past vlogs, but I think one of the things that I forgot to mention was the uh, property inspection or loading inspection. So when you're loading um, the trucks, when you're there and you're the truck driver, they have certain rules they have to abide by when it comes to cargo securement that I don't, I don't think we discussed the last time. First of all, uh, within the first 50 miles after you pull off of that lot, you have to inspect that cargo and you have to inspect the cargo securement tie-ons and whatnot. whatnot. So you got to pull over, you got to stop, you got to examine it, make sure it's all good, okay? Then the other thing is that if there's a change in your duty status, meaning if there's a change in your on-duty or off-duty driving status, if there are three hours of driving that you have been doing continually, uh, or not even continually, but if there have been three hours of driving, or if, they, or if you have driven for uh, 150 miles, I don't believe it's hours, I'm, I'm sure, sure it's not hours, um, driven 150 miles, whichever one of those comes first, that's when you have to get out again and you have to examine that cargo and you have to examine those tie-ons, the, the cargo security. Now, there are exceptions to uh, these three that I just listed, the change of duty status, the three hours of driving or driving 150 miles. Uh, if there's a, there are exceptions to that as far as examining the cargo or, or examining the, the trailer. If your uh, trailer is a sealed trailer, meaning you can't get inside of it, it's set up so that you are just there to transport that trailer and that's it, then that may not necessarily apply to you. This doesn't necessarily apply to you because there's really truly no way to examine the cargo inside of a sealed trailer. Um, the other exception is if you are ordered uh, to not inspect the cargo. Then in that case, those may not apply to you as well. So just keep that in mind. Now the only other thing that I want to cover today is when a tractor trailer is stopped on the side of the road or on the crest of a hill or going up a mountain or incline or going down a decline and the, and the truck breaks, breaks down, um, what happens then? What are you responsible for? What are truck drivers responsible for that we all should know? Okay, well a commercial motor vehicle has to have three has to have one of these three things, I'm sorry. Number one, three bi-directional emergency reflective triangles. You know, you see the little triangles. You throw them up like hove, you know, orange and red or whatnot. They glow or flash or whatever they do. You gotta, you gotta have three of those bi three bi-directional emergency reflective triangles, or you have to have six fuses. You know, the fuses already, they take them out, you know, and they burn in like that. You put them down on the ground. You gotta have six of those, or you gotta have three liquid burning flares. So, I mean, that's pretty much the same thing. Um, if you're stopped on the highway, you know, a, a good case to consult in all of this for stop tractor trailer cases is Wallace v. Enter. Um, if you need that case citation, I mean, email me, call me, or something, I'll give it to you. But that's a good case to reference for all that. If a, if a truck uh, driver is stopped on the side of the road, the first thing they need to do um, is they need to activate their hazard warning flashers. And you remember uh, yesterday, I, or not yesterday, maybe the day before, I talked about what to do in the event of a car accident. And I said the first thing that you should do is turn on your uh, hazard lights. You've got to notify people around you that something is going on, that something is wrong with your vehicle. So they have to activate their, warning ha uh, their hazard warning flashers. And these flashers or the hazard lights have to stay on uh, until these bi-directional emergency reflective triangles or the six fuses or the liquid burning flares, until those are set up around the truck, the hazard lights have to remain on. Now, a driver has no less than, generally speaking, about 10 minutes to place those warning devices all around the, around, around the unit. However, if, uh, if, if they fail to do that in 10 minutes, uh, the motor carrier can still be held liable for that, uh, for any injuries that result because of a failure to put the uh, warning devices out. If you can pretty much show that this should have been done or could have been done within a 10 minute time frame. So you're still not off the hook necessarily if you, if you don't, um, 
if you get these up less than 10 minutes. If you don't get them up less than 10 minutes, you still are not off the hook. You can still be found liable. And, and, and more so, probably more importantly for, uh, for truckers to know is that if you don't get those hazard warning devices up within 10 minutes, uh, you can be held liable for punitive damages because they're going to argue that it's a conscious indifference um, to the safety and well-being of the public. So punitive damages can apply. And, you, and you know, for a lawyer, for us, that's, I mean, that's like, uh, I mean, it's lovely, you know, to hear punitive damages, but truly and honestly, no one wants to have to deal with a case like this where someone is injured, um, let alone someone is injured because a trucker, uh, Fail to put up, you know, warning signals to let them know, hey, don't have a rear end crash with my trailer because I didn't put up my flares, or you know, don't have a, a under ride accident with me because my my truck is broken down in the middle of the highway and I failed to put anything up to let you know that. So, always put your warning devices up as soon as possible. Now, um, I said a driver has no less than ten minutes to place warning devices. Now, the, the, where they had to put the warning devices is they put them ten feet away from the direction of approaching traffic, 100 feet away from the vehicle in the center of the traffic lane or the shoulder of the road uh, for vehicles that are approaching the opposite way, or, um, or, I'm sorry, and 100 feet away from the vehicle in the direction away from approaching traffic. So pretty much, you know, what you have to do is you have to put those devices out there behind your trailer to let cars that are, that are coming or approaching know that your trailer and uh, tractor are broken down on the side of the road. Um, now, if your tractor trailer or CMV is on an, uh, it's on a uh, on a hill or it's on some type of incline decline, it's obstructed. The view of it is obstructed by some object or whatnot then you may have to put those uh, warning devices approximately about 500 feet away from the vehicle to be able to allow other people to know it's there. Additionally, if you're in the city or in a municipality and um, you don't have to put those up. If, if you don't have to put the warning devices up if you're in the city for the most part, if you're in a situation where um, you can, it's, there's light outside, and it's discernible, the trailer, the tractor is discernible from 500 feet away. Now, if it gets to the point where it's so dark outside that light doesn't make the view of your tractor trailer discernible from 500 feet away, then you have to put those warning devices up inside the city. Um, and like I said, I think that's pretty much it for today. This wraps up the FMCSR overview part two. We'll continue part three tomorrow. Until then, I'll see you later, and this is the end of the vlog.